Declaration of Independence says, we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We take that serious because as people we spend a whole lot of our lives searching in that pursuit of happiness. People pursue it in a lot of different ways. Some people are seeking for happiness. They're trying to chase it down in their professions. Maybe we want to find it in our marriages, find it in our hobbies. We keep looking and looking for this happiness. But if it was really that easy to find, why would we keep have to look for it? Why do we keep running and searching, trying to find it? It's because it's very elusive. But Jesus says he's got the answer. He says, I can give you the path to find happiness. And he tells us in John chapter 13, we're going to look at that this morning, verses 16 and 17. John chapter 13, if you'll open your Bibles, please. John 13, 16 and 17. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, neither is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. The Greek word for blessed is the exact same word that is translated in other places in the Bible as happy. Even some translations in this verse translated, some say happy, some say blessed. I think the, 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 uh, uh, the King James and the New Century version all say, have Jesus say, you'll be happy. In other translations, Jesus is saying, you'll be blessed. So Jesus is talking about them as being the same thing. They use the same word. So I'll just refer to this as, what do you have to do if you want to be happily blessed? That way just put them together. Well, Jesus says, if you want to be happily blessed, here's what you have to do. What did he tell you? He says, if you know these things and do them, then you will be happily blessed. If you know these things and do them, then you get the blessing. Notice that Jesus doesn't say just if you know them. He says you have to know them and do them. It's not enough to just know something and not do it if you want to get the benefit from it. We all know that you're supposed to eat right. <laughs> but if we don't do it, we can't expect to have the benefit that comes from eating right. So you've got to know it, but you also have to do it. Let's see. This is almost the first of March. We're getting close to tax season. We all know we have to pay our taxes. But if you don't do it, you're not going to enjoy the freedoms and liberties that you have because you will lose them. So you have to know the truth and you have to do it in order to expect to reap the benefit that is promised from no, we can do it. you got to do them both if you're going to get the positive result. So Jesus says, if you know these things and you do them, you'll be blessed. Okay. What are these things? If you've got to know something, what is it? He said these things. Or things. Well, keep in mind, we jumped in here right in 16. He's been talking for a couple of verses and he's been laying out some truths and then he gets to this part and says, you've got to know these things. And by knowing, he doesn't mean you just have a, a, a mental, intellectual understanding of, of being able to recollect a fact. That's not the kind of knowing that he's talking about. To know means to hear, it means to have a deep perception, 
and an understanding. And that understanding and perception is so great that it, it causes something to happen inside of you. So just to know something, you can know one thing, and it's just a trivial fact. But Jesus says, I don't, that's not kind of knowing and I want you to have. You've got to know, you've got to believe, you've got to understand, and you have to know that it's absolutely, positively true. And it is so true that it impacts your life. That's how you've got to know it. So here's what Jesus is saying you've got to know if you want to be happily blessed. First, that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Now we say it a lot of times, but saying it and knowing it is completely different. The word Lord there is the same word that is used back a couple verses earlier in, in verse 13, and Jesus calls himself Master. Lord means to be Master. And he goes on and says, a slave or servant, depending on your translation, is no greater than his master or his Lord. Jesus is claiming to be the master of your life. You are a slave to him. You are a servant. Now we, we give that lip service, but how, how much does, do we think about that in our daily life? That Jesus is our Lord. And by that means we are his servants. That means he has the authority to tell us what to do, when to do, and how to do everything. He's Lord. He's our master. Now, you go, well, pastor, that's, I, I always think of him as Lord. That's, yeah, yeah, I, I never think. Well, examine your prayer life. Think about it. How much time do we spend in our prayers telling Jesus what we would like for him to do for us versus asking him what he would like for us to do for him? Most of the time we have a whole list of things we are asking him to do. How much time do we spend asking him what we can do for him? You see, if he's truly Lord in our lives, we would spend more time asking him, yes, Lord, what can I do for you? Rather than the other way around. So the first thing Jesus is telling us is he is Lord. He is Lord of our lives. He is our master. And because of that, we get to the second item of what he's saying, one of those things you have to know. Because he is the Lord, we are not and cannot ever be greater than him. Jesus said, no servant is greater than his master, and no messenger is greater than the one who sent him. We, as his servants, we as his slaves, he is our master. We have to understand that we have no rights. And we have no authority. And we have no ability or power outside of him. Or without him. Without Jesus, we have no power. We have no true wisdom. We have no correct motives in our life. We have no merit to our lives. Because if you are born again, you are in Christ. And when we act outside of Christ, we've lost whatever power that we have as Christians. We have to understand in who we are. We cannot be greater than our Lord. The third thing we have to know. Since He alone is Lord, and not just our, He's not just our instructor, since He is our Lord, He is also our example. And Jesus even said as much in the verses just before this. And by that it means that we have to know and we have to understand that the right way that Jesus led His life is 
the right way in which we are to live our lives. How is it I'm supposed to live? Exactly like Jesus lived his. That's the guidelines. We have to live a Jesus-based with a Jesus-based Christian worldview. We have to see the world in the way that Jesus saw it. In a book by Charles Colson, it's called How Now Shall We Live? And it's talking about as Christians now, how should we live in this world? Now that we've been saved and redeemed by the blood of Christ, how now shall we live? And in this book, he, he uh, puts the Christian view up against many very worldviews that, that we run across. But in one of the quotes, let me read from it. He says that the Bible teaches that there is a holy God whose law constitutes a transcendent, universally valid standard of right and wrong. Yet a God who has established a universal law of right and wrong. And goes on to say that our choice has no effect at all on the standard. Our choice, choice simply determines whether we accept it or we reject it and suffer the consequences given by God. God has established the right way to live our lives. And the choices that we make don't change that standard. Our choices just determine whether we accept it or reject it. The life that Jesus led is that standard of living that God has given to us. How he treated people with compassion and forgiveness. How he lived each and every day to honor God. How he lived in complete obedience to the will and the word of God. That's the standard of what we're supposed to live. That's what we're supposed to know. It's the blueprint of life for every believer. Every follower of the Lord Jesus. One more quick thing. Since that's the blueprint, and we're supposed to be the examples, that means we're also supposed to be a minister. It isn't pastor or deacon or bishop, a minister. The word servant or slave is, the, is from the Greek word doulos. Doulos. It's the word that we actually get deacon from. But, but they're all the same word. They're all from the same root word. And they all mean to be a servant. To be someone who cares about and ministers to the needs of someone else. When we become servants of the Lord Jesus Christ and His slaves, yes, we serve Him. But He calls us to be ministers to serve those around us. We're all supposed to be ministers. And it's not a choice that we get to make. It's not a choice. It's a command to be one. And since it's a command, being a minister is our commission. When we are saved, we are commissioned to fulfill that purpose. Jesus was sent by the Father. In Matthew 20, 15, he said, the reason I was sent was to be a servant. He said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Jesus said, I was served to be a servant. And later in John's Gospel, in the 20th chapter, verse 21, he tells his disciples some of the last words he will speak to them before he leaves them. He tells them, and as my Father sent me, in the same way He sent me, my Father sent me to be a servant, as my Father sent me, I am sending you. I am sending you to be a servant. So the secret to finding the happy blessing in this life is to know these things. Do you truly know those things to be true? Or are they just words on the page? And if you know these things to be true, 
This knowledge should permeate our minds and our hearts in every single thing that we do. And this is the knowledge that, calls it, that grows hands and feet and affects our actions and our behavior. And we become to act according to those truths. And we do them. Just do it, as Nike would say. You have to live by these truths. And Jesus says, and then, if you know them to be true, and you do them, aha, then, then you will be blessed. Anybody here doesn't want to be blessed? The problem is sometimes we think about being blessed in the same way the world does. You know, the world would say, well, God's going to bless you? Great. Man, that's good health. That's a long life. Good prosperity, a little extra money. Financial security, good job, good home, peaceful household. Those are some blessings that I'm sure that that's what God means. Not what God is talking about at all. It's not that He doesn't grant those things, but Jesus isn't saying if you do these truths, that's what you will get. That's not the blessing that He's talking about. And thank God they're not. Because all of those things are very temporary. They're only going to last for a short window and be gone. I don't know about you, but I would like to have blessings that last a lot longer than that. Where I don't have to worry every day whether the life expectancy has expired. Amen. So what is Jesus talking about? What does he mean when he says you will be blessed? The blessing that Jesus promises is in the building of the type of character that God has designed for us to have. It's the building of a character in your life. Who are the people who are blessed like this? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn over their sin. Blessed are those who are meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who are pure in heart. And blessed are those who are the peacemakers. Jesus preached this. Jesus has a much greater blessing in mind for his followers that goes far beyond anything temporary that is physical and fleeting. And remember when Jesus preached about who was blessed on the Sermon of the Mount, he did not say that if you are poor in spirit, mournful, hungry, thirsty for righteousness, meek, peaceful. He didn't say if you do those things, then you'll get the blessing. That's not what he said, was it? He said these are the blessings. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are and what he is saying is, this is the blessings if we truly know the truths about the Lord that Jesus said we must know. And we know them with such conviction that it moves us and molds our daily actions and behavior. And we do the things that we know we are to do. Then we will receive these blessings. Then, if we know them and if we do them. And that blessing, that combined character that he's building, the description of what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, that character is the character of the Lord Jesus himself. 1 Peter 1, 8, 1 4 says that we will be, we are to be blessed to share in the divine nature that Christ has. So when we see Christ in the pages of the Bible and we see how he lived his life and we see his commandments and we see that if we will know who he is and know these things to be true and determine in our soul to do the things that he has told us to do and he has promised the blessing of sharing his divine nature not that we will become God but we will become like the man he was 
living here on this earth. We will share in His divine nature. And that divine nature, brothers and sisters, is the nature that God wanted us to have when He created us in the very beginning. When He created Adam, it was the nature that Adam had. Jesus was the second Adam because the first one messed it up. And if we will know the truths about the first Adam, then we will act like He did. Jesus said, I will give you the blessing of being able to share my divine nature. It's the nature that Jesus displayed for all of us to follow. To be like, to act like, and to love like Jesus. There is no greater blessing. Father God, as, as we walk through this life, help us to keep our eyes on Jesus. Lord, I'd ask that you would help us to remember his position over our lives. Help us to surrender our wills and our plans to his. Help us, Lord, to walk in his light toward the many promised blessings that come from our obedient servant.